in the last video, we talked about value chains, which represent what businesses do in order to make money. Now, in this video, we're going to actually talking about business processes. We're actually getting into the finer detail about the processes of creating value. So let's talk about it. Now, I want you to recall in the last video, we talked about the value being the amount of money that a customer is willing to pay. And the margin is the difference between the value of an activity and its cost, or at a higher scale, the value of an entire process, like a value chain, and the cost, the uh, cumulative cost of that value chain. And we want to maximize the margin in a business. A value chain is a network of value creating activities composed of both primary activities and support activities. And in the last video, we went through an example involving a drone manufacturer. Now a business process is a network of activities that generates value by transforming inputs into outputs. And the distinction between a business process and a value chain is specifically this transforming inputs into outputs piece of it. The value chain is a representation of what you are doing in order to create value, but a business process is a, essentially a representation of how you're doing it. So how are you actually achieving each step of the value chain? What are the actual details of every activity? And how are those details going about transforming inputs into outputs and thus creating value. So what I want to do is I want to talk about an example that the textbook actually goes into for a fictional company called Best Bikes. It is a bicycle parts retailer. What they have is a website where you would go and you would order parts for your bicycle. So what they do is they negotiate with vendors in order to supply parts. Once they have that contract with the vendors, they'll actually list the parts on the website. They'll take pictures of everything, give the technical specifications, all the information that a person who is trying to buy parts for a bike, whether it's an individual trying to make a repair or a company, maybe a bicycle repair company that might try to repair multiple bikes, it gives them all the information that they need on their website. Once that all is listed, they actually make an order from the vendor and place that order in inventory. When the customer orders, they remove parts from the inventory and ship them to the customer. And then they keep records of all the activities, everything from the contracts that they have with the vendors, the orders that they made from the vendors, and then the orders that customers made from Best Bikes. So here is a representation of the best bikes business process. And this is probably a lot to take in. This is a diagram that's constructed in what's known as business process modeling notation, which is a standard notation where every single symbol on here gives you some piece of information about a certain part of that business process. Now, what I want to note here is that we have the vendors and the customers included in this business process because the vendors are providing inputs. The customers also are providing inputs. And then we are giving outputs back out to the vendors and to the customers. So our interactions with the vendors and customers are a part of the business process here. And in the meantime, there's the three parts that actually directly have something to do with us, with Best Bikes, if we work for Best Bikes. The three parts here are buyer, the buyer, which is the part of Best Bikes that actually buys parts from the vendor. There's the website sales, uh, the part of the website, you know, where we list the parts and then customers purchase parts from the website. And then the operations, which manage all of the, you know, getting stuff in stock, taking things from stock and shipping them, all of that kind of stuff. So with all that in mind, let's take a look at the business process modeling notation, notation so we can take a look at every single type of symbol that's on this process. So when we have a business process modeled in this way, 
uh, we have all of these symbols that we'll be using in order to give certain information about pieces of that process. So we have these two circles. We have the start circle and the end circle. The start circle is a thin circle and the end circle is a thick circle. And these specifically refer to where the process starts and ends for us. It doesn't have anything to do with where the vendor starts and ends or where the customer starts and ends because they all have their own processes that they're working on and the only relevant things that they're doing are things that interact specifically with our own processes. So we only really care about the start of our process and the end of our process. These rounded rectangles, these rectangles with rounded corners represent a specific activity. They are a certain action that we're doing. For example, selecting a vendor product is the activity where we determine what products we actually want to stock. Now, the subprocess uh, entry right here refers to an activity that is so complicated that it has its own business process. And that business process is known as a subprocess because it is a process that helps determine the larger process that we're working on right now. And we're not actually going to take a look at the subprocesses for this larger process right here. But when you see, specifically when you see this plus sign that is surrounded in a box, you know that this is a complicated process. It's a complicated activity. It's so complicated that it requires its own process in order to work with. So you would then end up looking for a separate process so you would know, you know, what actually do you need to do in order to set up the product offering on that website. But for a higher level perspective, we don't really need to get into the weeds of all that. So that's kind of why we collapse everything into a sub process like this. When you see a parallelogram, when you see a parallelogram specifically that has its top and bottom sort of flat, parallel to the top and bottom of your screen or the edges of the paper or something like that, uh, that is going to refer to a data repository. And that data repository essentially means, you know, you have all this information contained in some sort of database so that you can access that information later on. In this case, the vendor order repository is going to be a list of all the parts that we have ordered from that vendor, from that vendor, including the quantities that we've ordered and the dates that we have ordered. And we can use a data repository like this to determine, you know, are we ordering too much or too little of a certain product? How often are we needing to make orders? Should we start making more orders less frequently? All that kind of stuff. Uh, if we need to order the same part again, we can easily look that up in the order repository. And we can even, you know, this is kind of getting into the area of where we can use information systems here. Maybe we can use information systems as well as the order repository in order to determine, should we keep on ordering this part? Should we order in greater or fewer quantities? Should we stop ordering this part at all? But that's a little bit uh, in the future. In this case, you know, the data repository is just, we hold a whole bunch of data there that might be relevant for some sort of activity or subprocess. A diamond is going to refer to a decision. So when we come across a diamond in this process diagram, that's going to say, okay, we have to make a specific decision here. And when we make that decision, we are going to follow a certain path that then determines what actions we should take, what activities we're going to follow through on. So this allows for some amount of conditional thinking in our sub process. We don't actually just have to say, okay, do all of these steps and then we're done. We can actually make decisions based on say, quality of materials or quantity of an order or things like that. So the decision allows us some amount of flexibility. So there's two types of arrows on a um, process diagram like this. The first type is the data flow uh, arrow, and that's actually going to represent how data actually flows between activities in a process diagram. So for example, when we come up here, let's take a look at this uh, 
operations area right here. When after we have set up product offering on the website and we're actually ready for that item to sell, what we have to do is we have to determine the order quantity. We need to determine how much of a specific part that we're trying to order from the vendor. And when we determine that we have a vendor order that we're going to start passing through to all of the other um, all of the other activities and data uh, repositories and stuff through this particular area. So we have this vendor order that we're passing from the determine order quantity activity to the order goods from vendor activity. So once we have our vendor order inside this activity, then we'll actually do the action of ordering from the vendor. From the vendor, uh, we'll pass along that order both to the vendor so that they can then receive that order and then ship the goods and we'll pass it on to the vendor order repository which then from there we'll pass that order on to the receive goods place in inventory sub process now the vendor shipment what you'll actually um, see here is this is referring to a physical shipment of parts but we're not actually talking about that physical shipment the actual parts here in this process diagram, we are talking about the data regarding that shipment. So what actual parts have actually been shipped to us? So the names of the parts, the quantity of the parts, all that kind of stuff. And what we'll do is receive goods placed in inventory sub process here. We'll take in the order and the shipment as inputs, and it will compare the order against the shipment. They'll say, okay, Let's take a listing of all of the parts we have received and a listing of the orders that we have given that vendor and see if they match up. And if they don't match up for some reason, then maybe we have to contact the vendor and say, hey, you, you messed up our order. And if they do match, then we can just place it in the inventory and then get ready to ship our orders to our customers. So this doesn't talk about the actual physical shipment right here. I want to stress that this is talking about the data of the shipment. So the data of what what is contained in that box rather than the physical parts themselves. So when you see a dashed line like that, this is some piece of data that's flowing. Another example here is this purchases data right here. This is going to refer to the actual purchase that the customer has made. So this might include like, a product ID, a quantity, a customer um, shipping address, the payment, you know, the status of whether or not the payment has gone through, all of that kind of stuff. And all of those will affect, you know, should we continue keeping the product on our website? Should we continue or should we get ready to sell the item? Is it actually ready to sell because the customer has actually ordered it and if the customer hasn't ordered it if they haven't if their payment hasn't gone through all that kind of stuff then the item wouldn't count as being ready to sell so we have all of these different pieces of data and we can look at how the data is being passed between these different activities here i think a really interesting piece of data flow is this negotiation area because this has to do with the seller saying hey this is what we're looking for that price in and of itself is a piece of data as well as the response that you're giving saying well we're only willing to pay this much but we'll like per item but we'll buy this many items if you are willing to do that that would also be pieces of data that the vendor can then use transform that into information to then determine hey is this worth it or should we give another counter offer so the negotiation data the data associated with different offers and counter offers is going to actually be data flowing between the vendor and the buyer right here. So that all is data flow. So data flow talks about the flow of information from one activity to another. But on the other hand, sequence flow, which is represented by an arrow with a full line and no little empty circle at the end, uh, the sequence flow is actually going to represent how we uh, continue along from one activity to another. And that sequence flow might actually have a specific condition associated with it where we don't follow that arrow until that condition is met. 
So going back to this process diagram right here, one uh, example of sequence flow is setting up the product offering on the website subprocess flowing into determine the order quantity uh, activity right here. And we have the sequence where we go from the subprocess to determining the order quantity only when the item is ready to sell. So as soon as this is ready, once we have the purchase information, once we have the item descriptions, specifications, photos, and prices, once all of that is ready to go, then we go straight into determining the order quantity and getting all of that uh, information, you know, the vendor order information, getting that to the vendor, actually receiving their stuff, all of that. Another example is um, the arrows from the start to select vendor product. You know, when we start, we actually have to start at a specific um, activity. So this uh, sequence flow arrow shows us that this select vendor product arrow or activity is the first one that we go to. And then immediately, you know, once we've received the data from both marketing and from our data repository, uh, we would select the vendor product and then immediately start going into the negotiation. We don't have to wait for anything else. We don't have to pass any information into this new activity. We are going from selecting the product into negotiating the prices and terms. Another example of the sequence flow is going like going from receiving the goods and placing into inventory that whole sub process into shipping the orders to customers. Uh, we go once our inventory is ready, then we start shipping, and then once we have shipped, we then finish the process. And then the last piece of the business process modeling notation is the annotation. So if we need to make any sort of notes, you know, clarifying a certain activity or data flow, or if we need to, say, ask a question on a rough draft uh, business process, you know, maybe we, maybe we have our initial business process for a new change that we're trying to make, but we don't know the exact certainties of what that change is going to be. We can put down our best thoughts for introducing a new aspect into our process, and then use annotations to clarify, you know, this is where we still have questions, this is where we still need to do some research, or clarify, you know, this is why we added this new area into the business process. So the annotation allows the reader to get more clarification on certain aspects of a process diagram. And we're not seeing that, you know, here in the original business process diagram, but we will see some in just a second. So I will show that off when we get there. The last thing that I want to talk about with this type of diagram is that it's actually in what's known as swim lane format. So you'll see that there are these vertical columns that separate the different pieces of this whole operation. So every vertical column describes all activities that a specific actor in this process is going to take care of. And an actor might be a person, it might be an organization, it might be a information system. An actor essentially is something that does activities or manages activities. So for example, all the activities that the vendor handles are included in the vendor lane. And that is going to include, you know, the vendor's marketing, the vendor's part in selling its own products and the vendor's products a uh, part in shipping goods once we have placed an order with them the buyer that would be the person within best bikes who is or the people in charge of best bikes who are in charge of actually figuring out what products need to be bought doing the the um, negotiations with the vendor managing the data repository and then sending information over to the website Website sales would be the actual website itself and the team that manages it. Then we have operations, people who control inventory, who determine what needs to actually be ordered, uh, receive the goods, store the goods, ship the goods, all that kind of stuff. And then the customer themselves 
are actors in this whole system because they are providing ordering information and then receiving the shipment. So every actor has certain roles that they're playing in this whole system, in this whole business process. Those roles are being represented by the activities and the sub processes, processes. And of course we have the data repositories with which those actors are managing and interacting with. So now in our Best Bikes example, suppose that Best Bikes is actually looking into 3D printing their own parts. So rather than ordering everything from manufacturers, maybe they can get by with 3D printing some parts, cutting some of the vendors out of the picture so they don't have to worry about ordering from them. They don't have to worry about negotiating from them. And would that allow them to reduce the costs in terms of the cost of buying from the vendors the cost of paying people to negotiate with the vendors, would they be able to then boost their own margins by offering 3D printing parts? So we need to know how the business process will change to determine the benefit of introducing 3D printing into this whole thing. We need to know both the work that we can cut out from the vendors and also the additional work that will be introduced by adding in our own 3D printing sector in our business process right here. So let's take a look at how that might affect the Best Bikes business practice. So what we have here is a what I would consider a rough draft of a business process that actually includes 3D printing. So we have the 3D printing added in as a new actor. This is going to be all the like all the systems that manage the 3D printing the systems where they actually, you know, create new parts or obtain plans for new parts, manufacture that product, check the product for quality, and then decide whether or not they're going to reject that part so that they have to create a new one or accept that part so then they can ship out that part to customers. And what we have right here actually are a couple of things that are really interesting. The first off is we have our own decision areas or our decisions right here. So for example, what we do is we make the product. When we make a specific product, we are checking that product's quality. And that's its own sub process because uh, 3D printing quality checking is complicated. But then based on the results of our quality check, we have to decide if we will accept or reject that part. And you can see the conditions on every single one of those lines right here. So this is the line that we follow, the sequence flow line that we follow if we accept, if we reject that part. So if yes, then follow this line back up to make the part. If no, then follow the line down to ship order to customers because we've decided that our parts are good, good enough quality. We're good to just ship that to customers. Another example here is actually the decision on whether or not we 3D print the part ourselves. So in the operations, we determine whether or not, or we determine what quantity of part that we need, and then we pass that directly into the question, are we 3D printing this part or are we ordering it from the vendor? If we 3D print it, that's when we send our order into the 3D printing sec section of our business. And if no, that's when we send it down to ordering the goods from the vendor. We also have all of these annotations. So for example, how do we negotiate with ourselves? This annotation talks about how we go about figuring out the cost of 3D printing the, um, the actual part. So if we're producing the part, obviously we don't need to negotiate with ourselves in the sense that we would negotiate with a vendor that we're trying to buy from. But we might also have to think about, well, how do we figure out what materials we're going to need and how do we like negotiate choosing a certain material or choosing a certain method or something like that over another one. So that negotiation annotation really brings to mind those questions as well as the fact that maybe the process diagram itself needs to be a little bit modified in order to account for the fact that we might not be selecting a vendor product for everything here. So it shows that this work may be, may need a little bit more work. We have more annotations on how we 
set up the product offering on the website. Maybe this needs to be, um, maybe when we make a product offering, we need to make a change in terms of how we let the customer know that this is something that we manufactured ourselves with 3D printing. Maybe we need to help tell them the certain materials that we're using here, whereas we might not need to necessarily do that with a vendor product. And then of course there's hiring production personnel, quality testing personnel. There would also be stuff like deciding which um, 3D printer you're going to use. If you're going to use multiple methods of fabrication, then selecting which 3D printer you're going to use for a specific part, all that kind of stuff. So the annotations show, hey, these areas might need further work within our company. So this is a business process right here. This is a diagram that shows how Best Bikes is creating value based on the inputs that it's getting, based on customer orders and the products that it's actually buying from a vendor. Now, a fun exercise might actually be to make a value chain for Best Bikes and then compare and contrast the value chain with the business process. But essentially, the value chain is what a business is doing in order to make value. And the business process is how that business is working with the inputs and outputs in order to create that value. So that is what a business process is. In the next video, we're going to bring all of this together and connect it back with information systems. So I, I know we've taken a little bit of a tangent from information systems, but in the next video, We'll talk about how information systems are connected to this whole thing.